Right, let's pick up from where we left off. Don't worry, Lavinda, you'll soon catch up, Miss Honey said, lying through her teeth. At this point, Miss Honey could not resist the temptation of exploring still further the mind of this astonishing child. She knew that she ought to be paying some attention to the rest of the class, but she was altogether too excited to let the matter rest. Well, she said, pretending to address the whole class, let us leave sums for the moment and see if any of you have begun how to, how to spell. Hands up anyone who can spell cat. Three hands went up. They belong to Lamida, a small boy called Nigel, and to Matilda. Spell cat, Nigel. Nigel spelled it. Miss Honey now decided to ask a question that normally she would not have dreamed of asking the class on its first day. I wonder, she said, whether any of you know how to spell cat have learnt how to read a whole group of words when they are strung together in a sentence. I have, Nigel said. So have I, Lavender said. Miss Honey went to the blackboard and wrote with a white chalk the sentence. I have already begun to learn how to read long sentences. She had purposely made it difficult and she knew that there were precious few five-year-olds around the world who would be able to manage it. Can you tell me what that says, Nigel? she asked. That's too hard, Nigel said. Lavender? The first word is I, Lavender said. Can any of you read the whole sentence, Miss Honey asked, waiting for the yes that she felt certain was going to come from Matilda. Yes, Matilda said. Go ahead, Miss Honey said. Matilda read the sentence without any hesitation at all. That really is very good indeed, Miss Honey said, making the understatement of her life. How much can you read, Matilda? I think I can read most things, Miss Honey, Matilda said, although I'm afraid I can't always understand the meanings. Miss Honey got to her feet and walked smartly out of the room, was back in 30 seconds carrying a thick book. She opened it at random and placed it on Matilda's desk. This is a book of humorous poetry, she said. See if you can read that one aloud. Smoothly, without a pause and at a nice speed, Matilda began to read. An epicure dining at crew found a rather large mouse in his stew. Cried the waiter, don't shout and wave it about or the rest will be wanting one too. Several children saw the funny side of the rhyme and laughed. Miss Honey said, do you know what an epicure is, Matilda? It is someone who is dainty with his eating, Matilda said. That is correct, Miss Honey said. And do you, know, do you happen to know what that particular type of poetry is called? It's called a limerick, Matilda said. That's a lovely one, it's so funny. It's a famous one, Miss Honey said, picking up the book and returning to her table in front of the class. A witty limerick is very hard to write, she added. They look easy, but they most certainly are not. I know, Matilda said, I've tried quite a few times, but mine are never any good. You have, have you? Miss Honey said, more startled than ever. Well, Matilda, I would very much like to hear one of these limericks you say you have written. Could you try to remember one for us? Well, Matilda said, hesitating, I've actually been trying to make one up about you, Miss Honey, while we've been sitting here. About me? Miss Honey said. Well, we've certainly got to hear that one, won't we? I don't think I want to say it, Miss Honey. Please tell it, Miss Honey said. I promise I won't mind. I think you will, Miss Honey, because I have to use your first name to make things run, and that's why I don't want to say it. How do you know my first name, Miss Honey asked. I heard another teacher calling you by it just before we came in, Matilda said. She called you Jenny. I insist upon hearing this limerick, Miss Honey said, smiling one of her rare smiles. Stand up and recite it. Reluctantly, Matilda stood up, and very slowly, very nervously, she recited her limerick. The thing we all ask about Jenny is, surely there can't be many, there cannot be many, young girls in the place with so lovely a face. The answer to that is not any. The whole of Miss Honey's pale and pleasant face blushed a brilliant scarlet. Then once again she smiled. It was a much broader one this time, a smile of pure pleasure. Why, thank you, Matilda, she said, still smiling. Although it is not true, it is really a very good limerick. Oh dear, oh dear, I must try to remember that one. From the third row of desk, Lavender said, It's good, I like it. It's true as well, a small boy called Rupert said. Of course it's true, Nigel said. Already the whole class had begun to warm towards Miss Honey, although as yet she had hardly taken any notice of any of them except Matilda. Who taught you to read, Matilda? Miss Honey asked. I just sort of taught myself, Miss Honey. And have you read any books all by yourself? Any children's books, I mean? I've read all the ones that are in the public library in the high street, Miss Honey. And did you like them? I like some of them very much indeed, Matilda said. But I thought others were fairly dull. 
Tell me the one you liked. I like The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, Matilda said. I think Mr. C.S. Lewis is a very good writer, but he has one failing. There are no funny books in his, funny bits in his books. You are right there, Miss Honey said. There aren't many funny bits in Mr. Tolkien either, Matilda said. Do you think that all children's books ought to have funny bits in them? Miss Honey asked. I do, Matilda said. Children are not so serious as grown-ups and they love to laugh. Miss Honey was astounded by the wisdom of this tiny girl. She said, and what are you going to do now that you've read all the children's books? I am reading other books, Matilda said, and I borrow them from the library. Mrs. Phelps is very kind to me. She helps me to choose them. Miss Honey was leaning far forward over her work table and gazing in wonder at the child. She had for completely forgotten now about the rest of the class. What other books, she murmured. I am very fond of Charles Dickens, Matilda said. He makes me laugh a lot, especially Mr. Pickwick. At that moment, the bell in the corridor sounded for the end of the class. The Trench Ball in the interval, Miss Honey left the classroom and headed straight for the headmistress's study. She felt wildly excited. She had just met a small girl who possessed, or seemed to her, quite extraordinary qualities of brilliance. There had not been time yet to find out exactly how brilliant the child was, but Miss Honey had learnt enough to realise that something had to be done about it as soon as possible. It would be ridiculous to leave a child like that stuck in the bottom form. Normally, Miss Honey was terrified of the headmistress and kept well away from her. But at this moment, she felt ready to take on anybody. She knocked on the door of the dreaded private study. Enter, boomed the deep and dangerous voice of Miss Trunchbull. Miss Honey went in. Now, most head teachers are chosen because they possess a number of fine qualities. They understand children and they have the children's best interests at heart. They are sympathetic, they are fair, and they are deeply interested in education. Miss Trunchbull possessed none of these qualities, and how she ever got her present job was a mystery. She was, above all, a most formidable female. She had once been a famous athlete, and even now the muscles were still clearly in evidence. You could see them in the bull neck, in the big shoulders, in the thick arms, in the sinewy wrists, and in the all-powerful legs. Looking at her, you got the feeling that this was someone who could bend iron bars and tear telephone directories in half. Her face, I'm afraid, was neither a thing of beauty nor a joy forever. She had an obstinate chin, a cruel mouth, and small, arrogant eyes. And as far as her clothes, well, they were, to say the least, extremely odd. She always had on a brown cotton smock, which was pinched in around the waist with a wide leather belt. The belt was fastened in front with an enormous silver buckle. The massive thighs which emerged from out of the smock were encased in a pair of extraordinary breeches, bottle green in colour and made of coarse twill. These breeches reached to just below below the knees and from there on down she sported green stockings with turn-up tops which displayed her calf muscles to perfection. On her feet she wore flat-heeled brown brogues with leather flaps. She looked in short more like an rather eccentric and bloodthirsty follower of the stag hounds than the mistress, headmistress of a nice group for children. When Miss Honey entered the study, Miss Trunchbull was standing beside a huge desk with a look of scowling impatience on her face. Yes, Miss Honey, she said, what is it that you want? You're looking very flushed and flustered this morning. What's the matter with you? Have those little stinkers been flicking spitballs at you? No, headmistress, nothing like that. Well, what is it then? Get on with it. I'm a busy woman. As she spoke, she reached out and poured herself a glass of water from a jug that was always on her desk. There is a little girl in my class called Matilda Wormwood, Miss Honey began. That's the daughter of the man who owns Wormwood Motors in the village, Miss Trunchbull barked. She hardly ever spoke in a normal voice. She either barked or shouted. An excellent person, Wormwood, she went on. I was in there only yesterday. He sold me a car. Almost new. Only did 10,000 miles. Previous owner was an old lady who took it out once a year at the most. A terrific bargain. Yes, I liked Wormwood. A real pillar of our society. He told me the daughter was a bad lot, though. He said to watch her, he said if anything bad ever happened in school, it was certain to be his daughter who did it. I haven't met the little brat yet, but she'll know about it when I do. Her father said she's a real wart. Oh no, headmistress, that can't be right, Miss Honey cried. Oh yes, Miss Honey, darn well is right. In fact, now I come to think of it, I bet it was she who put that stink bomb under my desk here first thing this morning. The place stank like a sewer. Of course it was her, I shall have her for that, you see if I don't. What she looked like? Nasty little worm, I'll be bound. I have discovered, Miss Honey, during my long career as a teacher, that a bad girl is a far more dangerous creature than a bad boy. What's more, they're much harder to squash. 
Squashing a bad girl is like trying to squash a blue bottle. You bang down on it and the whole darn thing isn't there. Nasty, dirty things little girls are. Glad I never was one. Oh, but you must have been a little girl once, headmistress. Surely you were. Not for long anyway, Miss Trenchable barked, grinning. I became a woman very quickly. She's completely off a rocker, Miss Honey told herself. She's as balmy as a bedbug. Miss Honey stood resolutely before the headmistress. For once, she was not going to be browbeaten. I must tell you, headmistress, she said, that you are completely mistaken about Matilda putting the stink bomb under your desk. I am never mistaken, Miss Honey. The headmistress, the only child arrived, the child only arrived in school this morning and came straight to the classroom. Don't argue with me, for heaven's sake, woman. This little brute, Matilda, or whatever her name is, has stink bomb my study. There is no doubt about it. Thank you for, suggest for suggesting it. I didn't suggest it, headmistress. Of course it did. Of course you did. Now what is it that you want, Miss Honey? Why are you wasting my time? I came to talk to you about Matilda, mistress, headmistress. I have extraordinary things to report about the child. May I please tell you what happened in class just now? I suppose she set fire to your skirt and scorched your knickers, Miss Trenchable snorted. No, no, Miss Honey cried out. Matilda is a genius. At the mention of this word, Miss Trenchable's face turned purple and her whole body seemed to swell up like a bullfrog's. A genius, she shouted. What piffle is this you are talking, madam? You must be out of your mind. I have a father's word for it that the child is a gangster. Her father is wrong, headmistress. Don't be a twerp, Miss Honey. You have met the little beast for only half an hour, and her father has known her all her life. But Miss Honey was determined to have a say, and, now, and she now began to describe some of the amazing things Matilda had done with her arithmetic. So she's learnt a few times table by heart, has she, Miss Trenchable Fox? My dear woman, that doesn't make her a genius. It makes her a parrot. The headmistress, she can read. So can I, Miss Trenchable snapped. It is my opinion, Miss Sunny said, that Matilda should be taken out of my form and placed immediately in the top form with the 11-year-olds. Ha, snorted Miss Trenchable. So you want to get rid of her, do you? So you can't handle her. So now you want to upload, unload her onto the wretched Miss Plimsoll in the top form where she would cause even more chaos. No, no, cried Miss Honey, that is not my reason at all. Oh, yes, it is, shouted Miss Trenchpole. I can see right through your little plot, madam, and my answer is no. Matilda stays where she is, and it's up to you to see that she behaves herself. But headmistress, please. Not another word, shouted Miss Trenchpole. And in any case, I have a rule in the schools that all children remain in their own age groups, regardless of ability. Great Scott, I'm not having a little five-year-old brigand sitting with the senior girls and boys in the top form. Who ever heard of such a thing? Miss Honey stood there helpless before this great red neck giant. There was a lot more she would like to have said, but she knew it was useless. She said it softly. Very well then, it's up to you, headmistress. You're darn right, it's up to me, Miss Trenchpole bellowed. And don't forget, madam, that what we are dealing here with a little viper who put a stink bomb under my desk. She did not do that, headmistress. And I'll tell you what, I wish to heavens I was still allowed to use a birch and belt as I did in the good old days. I'd have roasted Matilda's bottom for her so she couldn't sit down for a month. Miss Honey turned and walked out of the study feeling depressed, but by no means defeated. I am going to do something about this child, she told herself. I don't know what it will be, but I shall find a way to help her in the end. The Parents when Miss Honey emerged from the headmistress's study, most of the children were outside in the playground. Her first move was to go around the various teachers to talk the senior class and borrow from them a book of textbooks. Books on algebra, geometry, French, English literature and the like. Then she sought out Matilda and called her into the classroom. There is no point, she said, in you sitting in class doing nothing while I'm teaching the rest of the form, the two times table and how to spell cat and rat and mouse. So during each lesson, I shall give you one of these textbooks to study. At the end of the lesson, you can come up to me with your questions if you have any, and I will try to help you. How does that sound? Thank you, Miss Honey, Matilda said. That sounds fine. I am sure, Miss Honey said, that we'll be able to get you moved into a much higher form later on. But for the moment, the headmistress wishes you to stay where you are. Very well, Miss Honey, Matilda said. Thank you so much for getting those books for me. What a nice child she is, Miss Honey thought. I don't care what her father said about her. She seems very quiet and gentle to me. Right, we'll stop there because uh, that's the end of the page and we'll pick this up next time. I hope you enjoyed listening to this. Thank you, children.